is one of the best organisations I've ever worked in, in my 35 years in the NHS. It doesn't matter where you start, there'll be every opportunity to support, train, develop you. And do you know what? You'll just work with some really decent people. Well, I think life has a way of, of throwing various obstacles at you. I haven't got here because it's been easy. I've had to fight uh, to get here a lot of the time. Be who you are and hold your nerve. And don't let anybody tell you you can't do something. How did you perform on your A-levels? Uh, not as well as I should have, because as I said, I was distracted. And for those who have got good results at A-level and T-level, well done. You truly deserve it. For those of you who haven't, don't worry about it. I think A-levels are a step into life. And there are other routes into professional careers that aren't always about going to university. Welcome to the Expert Lounge. Today, I am delighted to welcome Brendan Brown, Chief Executive of the Calderdale and Huddersfield NHS Foundation Trust. Hi, Brendan. Hello. Thank you for having me. No problem at all. Thank you for, for being here. So, Chief Executive of the NHS Trust. Yes. That's a pretty big role. Yes, it's a great role. I'm really lucky and privileged. I feel incredibly blessed, and I don't mean that in a trite way. It's a great job. I started off as a nurse. Uh, I trained back in the 80s, so I am that old. Uh, but I started off as a nurse, yes, and I progressed through many different uh, jobs that were both clinical and managerial. And I've been the chief executive back here at Calderdale and Huddersfield for the past two years. Okay, brilliant. I mean, that, that was going to be a question, actually, because mm. I was trying to imagine you as a, as a young boy. Yes, yes, um, as a young man. <laughs> thinking to yourself... I know what I want to be. I want to be chief executive of the NHS. That's not something that you were thinking, right? No, I, I didn't really have a plan. So my A-level report said that Brendan is still resting from his O-levels. Uh, and my mum, uh, up until the day she died, still reminded me of that. I wasn't actually resting from my O-levels. I discovered work, right. so which got in the way of me doing my A-levels because I was earning money. Uh, so I worked at Tesco's. And whilst at Tesco's, uh, I was great friends with a lady called Helen Skeet who suggested to me that I should become a nurse. So it meant you could travel the world and you were paid whilst you were training. You got uh, accommodation paid for and it was a great job. So I got in and started my training uh, and that was it. Never looked back. I had an absolute ball for three and a half years. It was the best thing I've ever done. So fair to say then up until about 17 you had no clue what you wanted to do? Probably up until I was 18, until I applied to do my nurse training. Um, yeah, I didn't really know. And I, I I don't think you need to at that age, actually. Mm -hmm. See, it's probably easy for me to say at this point, but I don't think you do need to know what you're doing. It's life, life has a way of navigating a way for you. Were there any other possible career pathways? Yeah, um, I could have. Uh, I wanted to be a farmer. My, my family are farmers, so that would have suited me. And I did think about teaching for a while, um, but only a short while, actually. <laughs> Uh, and, and nursing was the one that grabbed me. And once I started, as I said, I never looked back. It was a great job working with people um, from every different background you could possibly imagine. And yeah, I've just had it. I've I've had the best possible time you can imagine. I would recommend it to anybody. So tell us a little bit about. I'm going to talk to you about university. Yes. I'm going to try and get some uh, insight into university life. Okay. Um, but just talk to us then about your A levels. So. You're working at Tesco. Yes. Check out? No, I was on the deli counter and I would, right. uh, Tesco were a great, um, I know there are other major supermarkets that we can talk about, <laughs> uh, but Tesco was a great employer, paid great money. I worked on the largest delicatessen counter in the country. Okay. Who knew? That's my claim to fame. Back in the days when Back someone used day. to slice your ham. Slice your ham, slice your cheese. So, And I didn't actually go to university because I am old. Uh, it was uh, when I trained, nursing was in what was very locality based. So I trained at the hospital where I worked. So I trained back in Derby. Um, and I went to university much later in life and did a master's degree. But at the time when I did my training, it was your registered general nurse training. So you needed your five O levels to be successful to get in. And I was successful. So A levels then, what A levels did you, did you study? <laughs> what A levels have I got? I've got English literature, uh, art and religious studies. Okay. And it's got me all this way. Well, I'm going to put you on the spot now, Brendan, <laughs> because, you know, I'm sure there'll be people... Um, having just gone through the result, the trauma of results or the triumph of, of results day, um, 
How did you perform on your A-levels? Uh, not as well as I should have, because as I said, I was distracted. And for those who have, uh, for those of you who've got good results at A-level and T-level, well done. You truly deserve it. For those of you who haven't, don't worry about it. It will be all right. Um, I think A-levels are a step into life. And there are other routes into professional careers that aren't always about going to university. You know, you can enter through work or you can do what I did and do further development and learning later in life. But so, live your life. Live your life and don't worry about it. <laughs> Absolutely. So you you train at Derby? Derby? Yep. Okay, so which hospital's that? Der it, at that time, it was the Derby Royal Infirmary and Derby City General Hospital. Yep. Okay, and what, presumably in your training, you have to go through a variety of yep. experiences. You do. You have to, you, you go through four very practical assessments over three and a half years. You have to pass end of year exams at the end of every year, and then you have a finals exam. Um, and I didn't work as hard as I should have uh, because I was having an absolute ball. It was great. Uh, so, But I did all right and I passed and I, I progressed to be a general nurse. Um, and I was an adult general nurse at that point. So I worked in acute care, which means anybody well, at my ward was dealing with uh, anybody with a, um, really acute respiratory infections or cardiac problems. And then I specialised and went into cancer care and end of life care. Okay. That must be pretty difficult to do it was well any job's difficult to do isn't it i think any job is is challenging but again for me it was meeting people and experiencing their life at the best and the worst of times and this job is this job i'm doing now isn't the difficult job that was probably the difficult job at the time i guess what's interesting for me because you know i was someone that trained to be a teacher mm. um because you you feel like you've got a real passion for that you know it's a vocation uh, and then you start to progress mm. through um, a number of roles, and you end up in a in a in a management role. Mm. And before you know it, you're not doing, you know, the front line of mm. what you set out to do. Mm. How does that feel sometimes? Well, so I think in nursing, I did leadership roles that meant I still had a perspective on what nurses, allied health professionals, and midwives were doing. And I still feel that now, whilst I'm the chief executive of the organisation, I'm influencing patient care and what, what the experiences our colleagues are having. I've still got a, a view and a voice on the nursing profession. But to your point, I'm not actually delivering nursing care. But I have a view on nursing. I'll always be a nurse, always will be a nurse, despite the fact I'm not working as one currently. So I brushed over it a little bit. but yeah. So we, we've talked about you doing your general nursing Practitioner training training yeah. yeah. So you stayed at home presumably to do that. Absolutely not. I left home as soon as I possibly could. <laughs> that was the beauty of nursing. You could go and live. Um, you could go and live and train at the same time. So I was straight out the door. Literally, as I turned eighteen, I was up and off. Uh, as I said, I had a ball. Yeah. So just give us some of the highlights. That I can't possibly because it'll be used <laughs> against me. The highlights were well, the training. You know, we we were trained intensively in how to how to be a nurse but equally you know i was in a cohort of um 48 people and you know all going through the same experience we just had the best time and that's what i'm saying you know for those of you who might not have had the results that you wanted in your a levels don't worry about it because it'll all come good you'll have a, you'll have a good time whatever you do but make the best of it i did you can work hard and in my view play hard and that's exactly what i did and so, for I mean, are you still in touch? Are you still <laughs> still in touch? Yeah, I had a reunion a couple of years ago um, with a bigger group, and then last year I met with about four or five people who are trained with. So yeah, we're still in yeah. touch. And are Why those, wouldn't you be? Are those nights still as wild no. as they were? No, 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 no. You reach a certain age where you have to calm down, don't you? <laughs> yeah, fine dining and wine. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So you talked a little bit about um, in those days it was a general nursing. Mm -hmm. um, certification mm. how does that differ to now so what are the routes into the profession now and and how might people navigate that journey well there are different routes into healthcare, but to um, enter either the nursing midwifery or any of the allied health professionals it's a degree entry profession so it is about accessing it through a degree but there are other routes as well such as through the apprenticeship route uh, or the um, or, or other trainee routes that you can get to. So again, that there's access to jobs such as um, 
a physio or an occupational therapy assistant or you could work a, as a healthcare assistant and then progress other training opportunities that ultimately could lead to you accessing a training course to either be a nurse midwife or AHP. There are several different routes into it and that's why I'm saying if if whatever age you are, 17, 18, 19, and you've not quite got the grades that you wanted, don't worry about it because there is a, a lifelong opportunity to offer to access healthcare. That's what I did. And I didn't have a degree when I qualified as a nurse. I went on to do my degree training later on in life. So. And I guess, you know, people's reference point with the NHS is often the interaction that they've had with it. Yeah. So how do people... You know, you'll quite often you'll you'll get an appointment come through, and you'll you'll look at the name of the role that you're going to to see, or the person that's going to be treating you. And how do people get an understanding of the of the variety of roles? How can they find out more about that? Talk to me or any of my team. We'll help you access the because there are there are so many different jobs. Everybody thinks that the NHS is just made up of nurses and doctors, but there I think there's. There's probably over 70 different roles that you can become involved in. Some of them are patient facing, some of them are non-patient facing. If you think about the work that we're doing digitally, uh, with, I've met with ministers this morning to talk about the work that we're doing with artificial intelligence. There's a, there's a breadth of work that we, we take forward that ultimately impacts on patient care, but some of it won't actually be directly involved with patients. There's administrative work. There's facilities work, there's grounds work, there's all sorts of different things that you could be doing. So there's there's numerous jobs that you could access, all, all with great opportunity and great training development opportunities for you. I mean, it's it's a huge organisation, isn't it? I mean, yeah, nationally national. huge. But um, in terms of, of of your part of it, the the, the foundation trust that, mm. that that you're looking after. How big is that? How many employ? How many so employees? we employ over six and a half thousand staff. Uh, we cover two main hospital sites, and we also offer all of community services in Calderdale. So we're a, we're considered a large district general hospital, um, and we're part of the West Yorkshire Association of Trusts. So you know, part of the there's that that, that includes Leeds, Bradford, Airedale, Mid Yorks, and Harrogate, Anders. So you know, there's a, there's a huge array of health services. We're the what's termed as the acute uh, sector, which means it's basically what it says on the tin. But if you want to describe it in a different way, we're the hospital and community sector. Then you've got primary care, which covers off GPs and the GP services that we've got. Um, there's prior, uh, there's mental health services, there are community services. The NHS is just simply huge. And I'm just interested because you know we. We think we're quite a big organisation. Yeah. You know, we've got a, 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 a rather large turnover. What's yeah. what's the what's the funding required to keep that going for for twelve months? For the organiser for Calder and Huddersfield Foundation Trust, we're half yeah. a billion. Wow, mm. that's incredible. Half a billion, but we need more because um, yeah. actually life's life's difficult, isn't it? And expensive. And I have a real view that patients and colleagues deserve the best. Um, but we're living in a world post-COVID, so we all know about inflationary pressures and the cost of living crisis. But, um, you know, the NHS is, is under immense pressure. Therefore, it needs funding to resource it appropriately. We're trying to rebuild our hospitals because our estate is old. And I have a view that patients and indeed our colleagues should both be treated and work in um, buildings that are, are modern and fit for purpose. So we're trying to rebuild our facilities. And again, I'd, I'd hope if you were coming to work with us, they're the sort of environments you'd be working in. I mean, that was going to be my next question, actually. If you were sort of um, reaching out to, to to young people or adults looking to reskill or retrain, um, what's the what's the draw for them to to work in that organisation? Um, so I would, and you would expect me to say this, wouldn't you? I'm the chief executive of this organisation, but I genuinely believe it. This is one of the best organisations I've ever worked in, in my 35 years in the NHS. And it's the best because of the people that I work with. They genuinely care for their patients, genuinely care for one another. You'll get great training opportunities. You'll get great development opportunities. And who's to say you won't be the next chief executive of that organisation? It doesn't matter where you start, there'll be every opportunity to support, train, develop you. And do you know what? You'll just work with some really decent people. You'll have a great time. This is probably a bit more of a uh, a kind of personal 
um, interest. Um, I'm intrigued, really. What was it like to lead that organisation through the the pandemic? Hmm. Um, for many of us, looking back, it, it feels like a, another life now, doesn't it? What was it like at the time? Because clearly there were huge challenges for for you, your staff, um, and and you were very much under the spotlight, weren't you? So I didn't lead Calderdale and Huddersfield because I was over at Air. I was the chief executive of Airdale at that point. Okay. But I, I don't think it really matters what organisation you're leading through the pandemic was an experience none of us had gone through before. So nobody has actually lived through a pandemic of this size. It was a global pandemic. And I, I think we were all challenged um, to lead, to think, to deliver care differently. Because nobody had experienced this kind of um, disease process, this spread, the impact on people both personally and professionally. I think one of the hardest things that I saw was how this impacted on colleagues who were caring for patients all day, every day, and then having to care for their family members and their friends, who many who sadly lost relatives and friends through from COVID. So that was one of the most difficult things. But I also think the prolonged period of the pandemic had an impact on us as a society. And so I, I don't think it's just about what happened in health. I think it happened to everybody. You know, I'll always be grateful, I think, to the public for the support that they gave to the NHS. But I think the bin men needed just as much support because we all had our bins emptied. I think all of the supermarket shelves were stocked. You know, lots of people carried on delivering to make sure that we all lived as best as we could through the pandemic. So the credit needs to go to everybody. But I absolutely think the NHS um, did a phenomenal job. Right then, back to your current role. Mm -hmm. Tell us, what's what's a day in the life of Brendan Brown, Chief Exec? So no two days are the same, and that's why I like it. So it's incredibly varied. Um, it's really interesting. I can be talking about um, what's happening in our emergency departments and then what's happening in our cancer services. Then I can be filming a podcast about leadership. <laughs> uh, I can be talking to volunteer groups. I can be talking to... A group of nurses or a group of doctors. I, I can be doing all sorts of different things. This morning I met with ministers to talk about the potential for artificial intelligence and how they need to support, innovate and fund us to take that initiative forward. No two days are ever the same. It's varied, uh, it's lively, it's energetic and I get to see the best of people. So what time... Do I, uh, give, give me a breakdown. So I want to know, are you up at four o'clock pounding the streets getting a run in what 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 does your day look like well looking at me it's clear that i'm not <laughs> pounding i mean i'm clearly not a trained athlete am i but uh, i'm an early bird so i'm usually up for about half past five six o'clock i'll be in work for half past six or seven and then the average day finishes about half six seven o'clock so um but you know most of my team work long hours most of the people who are working on wards do 12 hour shifts so you know Every, everybody works hard. And again, I think that's beyond the NHS. It's in most sectors, isn't it? But um, yeah, I, I tend to be brighter in the morning as well. You, I get my brain functions differently at the start of the day. So looking back, was there something or someone that inspired you, that influenced you and, and, and sort of steered you in, in, in this direction? Yeah, so there's there's a couple of things. So the reason I'm a chief executive is um, probably because I'm a bit of a rebel and um, I was told that nurses wouldn't be, couldn't make chief executives, which drove me forward and made me... I'm quite stubborn and thought, well, actually, I think we can. <laughs> so I wanted to prove that nurses can make good chief executives. Um, I, I, one of my uncles, who, again, sadly has died now, but he was... Um, a very understated character who took me under his wing. I'm one of 11 children, came from a school of hard knocks. You know, my childhood wasn't idyllic. Um, and that's not me bleating, it's just life. Um, but I had an uncle who just looked out for me and his mantra in life was, have a go, give it a go. Never let anybody tell you you can't do something and be your best. Uh, and I've always remembered it. And he also taught me how not to take life too seriously, to have some fun whilst ever you're doing anything. Have some fun, enjoy it. And it, uh, anyone else? 
Um, are you thinking about a famous figure or just people in luck? Because I think, you know, I, I can think about one of the healthcare assistants I met on Friday morning and one of the wards who was going all out um, to make sure her patients were well cared for. She'd been to the shop to buy them all chocolate out of her own money. And they're the sort of people who inspire me. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, I could talk about political figures, um, but I think it's people like that who you meet day to day, every day. They're the ones who make you think, oh, okay then. I need to up my game. Yeah. I'm just thinking about something that you said there about sort of, you know, overcoming barriers, resilience. How how did you build that? How did you build resilience? How did you face up to challenges? How did you move forward when things perhaps hadn't gone how you'd hoped? Yeah, I mean, my, like I said, my, you know, if you... If we, I'm one of eleven children. If you if you talk to my brothers and sisters, we'd probably all say the same. But I don't think it's a case of building up your resilience. Resilience just comes with experience, and you know, I always think whenever you're in a difficult situation, there's a life beyond that. It will get better. I'm an eternal optimist, um, and life doesn't always go as you want it to do. You know, life things go wrong. Results aren't always as they want you to, as you want them to be, or you might not get the job that you want, but my view of life is persevere and think beyond this because there will be a life beyond it. And if you think about work versus your personal life, I think they too often blend. But don't let work invade your personal life either. You've got to think, you've got to live your life. And that's why I always say, enjoy what you're doing and have some fun while you do it. So we've got, we've got that part of your journey that you've, you've, decided to go into nursing you've had a great time while you're training um and you've um settled on general general nursing. i was a general nurse yet yeah, specialized in um palliative and end of life care um and then progressed through the ranks so i led departments but actually the rebel in me meant i kept going back to clinical jobs so i was a manager for a period of years and then I went back to working on the wards and, and working clinically because I wasn't quite ready to step away from mm -hmm. it. And I was told um, by a very senior person in the NHS um, to stop dipping my toe in the water and to get properly wet, which I think was a, probably a very polite way of saying, grow up, Brendan. Uh, yeah. you, need to step, you need to step up now, which made me more stubborn and I carried on doing <laughs> what I was doing. So I've got here on my terms. And again, mm -hmm. that's what I'd say to people. You've got to have people who are driving and guiding you, listen to them. But trust your gut, do it your way. I've I've done this my way because you can only be who you are. Have you have you had a professional mentor in that time? I've Someone had, that's Yep. <laughs> Excuse me. I've had various <laughs> mentors and coaches um who, who have really helped and guided and tested me and you know, um when, when I so midway through probably my nursing career and before I formally stepped into management, I I, I, I didn't quite step out, but I, I, I took a slightly different route and, and trained to be a counsellor. Um because of, of the view that life's for living and I didn't want to get boxed into doing one thing so mm. I did something else as well uh, and I, that opened my eyes to doing things differently and doing things on my terms so you've stepped you, you've done a few leadership roles any any jobs that you went for that you didn't get yes I'm having to revisit that now so any jobs I didn't get uh, I went for an assistant director of nursing job once and I was told um, the feedback I had was they didn't give me the job because they didn't think I really wanted it and that um, ever so slightly patronisingly they said to me uh, you will get there at, at some point which made me <laughs> even more determined to go all right <laughs> so I skipped the assistant director route and went straight into being a, a deputy and then a chief nurse but yeah it probably spurred me on actually yeah. made me more stubborn and I've read that you were part of the first cohort for a national leadership I was. Programme. When I became a chief executive at Airedale, I was invited to join the national leadership cohort of, of, of leaders, which was made up of chief executives from health, from education, from the armed forces, uh, director generals of the BBC, um, fire service, police, ev every possible profession you could think of. One of the best things I've ever done. Uh, and it was reassuring to meet other people who had exactly the same challenges as I did. So who ran that? Where was that? So that was the government who rang it. It, it was pre-COVID, so I think they're, they're revisiting it now. But I think if you're a leader, I think you have the, the same challenges and the same ask in whatever sector you're working in. 
So whoever whoever's watching this, think you can be a leader in whatever you want to do. Yeah. Don't let anybody tell you you can't. And every route, you know, mm. there's lots of different routes. Lots to get of different there. routes in, and you know, the police have you know various routes. The army have various routes. Education has various routes. You know, find your route. So, you've just touched on it. You were. Um, Executive Director of Nursing and Deputy Chief Executive at um, Calderdale and Huddersfield and Burton um, NHS Trusts previously. And then you went to Airedale. I did, yeah. Um, as their Chief, Chief exec. exec. So now you're back. Now I'm back. So what brought you back? So I had the best time I could ever have hoped for at Airedale. They were a phenomenal group of people and... Um, we did a lot of work at Airedale. Uh, we really, as, as a as a as a hospital community, we really forged forward. Um, and uh, you know, I did have other offers whilst I was there, but it needs to be the right offer. And that's the other thing. I think you can get caught up in the treadmill of wanting to progress all the time, but I have to work with people that I respect and get energy from. So I was only ever going to move to an organisation. I felt I fitted in, mm -hmm. it would let me be myself, live by my values, and Coldale and Huddersfield was that. So, yeah, I was enticed back over the hills. Values then, what are they? So my values are, it's it, I don't think they're complicated. It's about honesty, integrity, integrity, and treating people in the right way. Treat people as you'd want to be treated. So you touched a little bit there on um, not letting work spill into your private i mean sometimes it's inevitable um but what do you do then i mean it's got to be fairly full on it's it's got to be a stressful role that you're doing so what do you do to relax what what do you do to switch off so what so what i mean is you've got to you've got to live your life as well and you can put all the hours into work but you've got to have a life outside of it as well so whatever floats your boat do it um, and when you're living your life, my, I have a, a mantra that you need to be present in it because you can easily be distracted when you're in the presence of your family or your friends, your loved ones or, or doing something else when you're not really there. You've got to live in the moments and, you know, work will always be there, but you've got to be able to live a life as well. So I'm not the party boy I was, Carl. I think that's what you're asking. No, I'm not. <laughs> uh, but what I've got is a, a small holding with three rescue donkeys and that's what keeps me very grounded. So three donkeys are great. I'd recommend them to anybody. Three donkeys absolutely keep you grounded and level. And uh, yeah, they're hilarious. So what <laughs> What drove you to get three donkeys? <laughs> so the uncle I talked about had a farm in Ireland. So we grew up with donkeys when we were small. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could let you now, but uh, donkeys are often the most abused animal you can come across so you will see the adverts and they are truly terribly treated they're often shipped to various countries for meat uh, so i've got two rescue boys who came together and then there was an elderly girl who'd been horrifically beaten and nobody wanted her so i said i'd have her and they're the best thing ever they're hilarious so i'm gonna have to ask what are their names well they came with names so they're called jake reuben and katie and i haven't yeah. changed their names uh, i want to get two rescue pigs next that's my next project yeah excellent yeah they're great so You've obviously got a, a a passion for nature, for wildlife. Have you got any other pastimes that you that you you, you like to to do to relax or? Switch yeah, off? well, I'll probably take my own medicine. I've got a great life. I've got lots of friends, and you know, I've got a good family who, who who support me. They're all probably spread throughout the country, but I invest time with them. And you know, when I'm not at work, I'm not at work. I'm I'm enjoying my life. And, doing things e eating usually i eat a lot it's it's a great joy enjoy of cooking no i don't enjoy cooking no. i enjoy eating um <laughs> i absolutely enjoy it but and i i like being around people i get a lot of energy just from being around people so have you got dogs i've got a rescue dog everything's rescue in my house yeah i've got a rescue dog so i like out, being out with the dog and walking and doing and you know, I like I don't go out as much as I used to to see show. Uh, you know, to look. I can't say that I'm gigging. I'm 53 years old, uh, but I did used to go and see a lot of bands, but not really much now. But I like comedy shows, and you know, I'll, I'll do. I'll have a go at anything, me. So, you say that. I've, I'm, I've I've read that you've been quite heavily involved in volunteering in the past. Oh, in the past when I had time, yeah. So when I, as I said, I, I retrained as a counsellor, yeah, I worked for. 
Rate Crisis, which was a phenomenal experience. I was really lucky to work with them. Um, yeah, I've had a lot of, uh, I did I did do uh, quite a bit of volunteering work, but I was a much younger man with much more time. But um, it was a great experience. It was really good. I worked with uh, some mental health uh, and some lonely disability charities. I, I did lots of different things. It was great at the time, but I had the time to do it. And again, because I, I wanted to be present and involved and enjoy it. I mean, what did you get from those experiences? And would you, what advice would you give to, to young people who, who might be thinking about um, supporting an organisation or, or getting involved um, with a charity? I would say, hold your nerve. You've got a lot to offer. I think we're a bit sniffy about young people and think, you're young, what would you have to offer? I think you've got bags to offer. So keep knocking on doors until they let you in. Do it. And, um, you know, we need people to volunteer. We need people to support. We need to support one another in society, I think, because life is hard. Now, you come across, Brendan, as an incredibly warm positive i wonder what you were going to say then Carl. yeah i was getting anxious on film yeah no, you, you you come across very warm very friendly very positive but you know maybe it has all been um sort of great along the way but most people will have some sort of setback or challenge that has had the potential to derail them what what was yours and how did you get back on track well, I think life has a way of, of throwing various obstacles at you. As I said, my childhood wasn't great. Um, and probably when I was, as, as a child, I didn't really realise that. But then as you grow and develop, I, I probably spent some of my adult years looking back and working that through. Um, I've had lots of significant deaths of family members, which um, throws you off. But um, And work has been challenging. You know, I haven't got here because it's been easy. I've had to fight uh, to get here a lot of the time. But what, I'll go back to what I've probably, I've tried to say in this, which is find your own path, be who you are and hold your nerve. And don't let anybody tell you you can't do something, ever. And, you know, with the, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, mm -hmm. you, look back what would you change if you could change anything what what would you change about your journey your your career path well i'm not sure i'd change anything about my career path um i'd probably i'd probably if i could go back i'd, I'd worry less about it because you can get caught up in the worry can't you of am i good enough am i able to do this am i as good as everybody else you get that imposter syndrome of how have i got here how could i possibly be doing this I'd worry less. I'd, I'd tell my younger self to worry less because you'll have more hair as you get older. That's what I'd be saying to them. Worry less, live more. Do you still get imposter syndrome? Yeah, all the time, all the time. But I think that keeps me grounded. I think oh. it's right that we should question ourselves. But, you know, we all have doubts, don't we? I, I, I've, I've reached a stage in my life where I think I'm comfortable with what I'm uncomfortable with. Um, and it's important to hang on to that. So you talked about the, um, the, the national... Um, leadership program. Yep. We've talked about leading through COVID and the challenges of um, heading up a, a big organisation. So what do you do to become a better leader? And what's your advice for other people starting their leadership journey? I might answer that in reverse order, I think. So I, I don't think it's about starting a leadership journey. I think everybody is a leader. Everybody has a leadership ability or a leadership quality and push yourself forward take take an opportunity if it arises take a chance bang on doors if they're closed take the lead i think we see leaders you know across the media or in traditional roles and we think we'll all we'll all have to conform or be like them but what i would say to you is be yourself you can only lead and be the person that you are so be genuine to yourself listen to your inner voice and think about either your doubts, concerns or worries, but equally think about what you're successful at. At Think about the positives, but you'll only be successful if you surround yourself and listen to the people that you work with. So, you know, no leaders on island. Work with your people. F find those people who are going to challenge you and make you think as a leader. 
And what about sort of practical, you know, practical steps that people can take to, yes, some of that's, um, you know, going to be sort of developed through experience and time. What practical steps might people be able to take to to improve their approach or, or you know, get ideas on how to be, <clears throat> excuse me, a better leader? So I think we talked, we mentioned volunteering earlier. That's an example of, don't always take the traditional route. If there are other opportunities in front of you, take them. There are, you know, there's lots of training around leadership and development. If you get the opportunity, do it. But equally, don't think that you've got to pursue either a training or academic route to be a successful leader. Um, there are different routes. And think about the practical experience that you're gaining when you're either on a course or in a job. That will count to you being a leader. Hold your nerve. Have an opinion. Now, I know that we're working very closely with your organisation at the moment, but why is it important that organisations like ours um, work closely and develop strong partnerships? Because both of our organisations, so Health and, and the College, will only be successful if they work together. And I think, Carl, you and I have a responsibility and I don't mean this in an ageist way, but I think you and I have a responsibility to the young people that we're working with to give them a better experience than the one we had. We probably came from, you know, we had harder knocks and opportunities weren't opened up for us. We need to make that better for the people, the younger people that we're working with. And in my view, they've got the ideas. They're actually the ones who are going to be delivering health and education over the next 10, 15 and 20 years. So therefore, let's invest in them because they'll be leading in the future. And I guess we've got some shared challenges, haven't we, around... You know the, how we um, how we develop the organisation digitally, mm. how we support our staff to mm. develop those skills, sustainability, mm. um, and working to find ways together to create pathways into into employment. So absolutely, I, I think we talk. You know, it's easy to talk about how do you become a nurse or how do you become a doctor or a midwife, but actually, how do you become a digital leader in health. Well, there are lots of different routes through that. The apprenticeship route is one, but you'll have the ideas that I won't have. So let's let's tap into your skill set as a, you know, you might be a gamer or a, you know, you, I don't know, you might be able to do something with a tablet that I would never dream of being able to do, but I need to tap into your energy and your ideas because you could be remotely monitoring my hospital in the future and thinking about how the heating or lighting or, uh, medical tech equipment is run. So we need to tap into your thought process and say, right, make it better for us in the next 10, 20, 30 years time. Um, and as I said, there's lots of different jobs. There's accounting, there's human relations, uh, there's there's back office functions, there's catering, there's, there's, there's a plethora of jobs in the health service that you could access as well as those clinical roles. So, you know, think about us as, um, a career for life and a job for life. And if you start off in one sector, you can end up in another. That's what I did. And I know the NHS provide apprenticeship opportunities. What What's your experience of that? And would you recommend um, the the apprenticeship model to other businesses? I absolutely would. Um, we've had a great experience. We've got people who are working permanently for us, who are supporting the apprentices going through the programme. And it's not just in the traditional healthcare roles, as I've said. We've done it across some of our digital work and in other uh, non-patient facing um, departments. It, I'd recommend it to any business. It's the way forward. Um, and I think the people who've been doing the apprentices have really reinvested in us. Actually, we've learnt a lot from them. It's a two-way process. Do you ever go back to the floor? I do go back to the floor. I, so I walk about all the time. I go into wards, departments. I go everywhere. Um, I don't actually nurse anymore. I probably, I could, but there is only one of me in the six and a half thousand people. So I can't, I can't get to every person. But yeah, I'm out and about all the time because I like to see what's going on. I'm naturally nosy. And how do staff respond when you when you walk into a department or you walk into an office? Well, some are pleased to see me, some aren't. Um, <laughs> and some will want to tell me what their problems are. But for the, I, as I said, I work with great people. There's six and a half thousand people in the organisation who are pretty phenomenal. So it's, it's a pleasure to meet them. I'm really lucky to work with them. So what's next for you? Um, and what what are the developments that you're working on at the moment in your 
in your current role. So what's next for me? More of the same, I hope. Um, this job, I've still got lots I want to do in it. Um, we need to rebuild and reconfigure both of our hospitals, as I've said. And in the context we're all operating, and that's not easy. Um, so, you know, we're working with government to try and get funds released to improve services at both Halifax and Huddersfield. Um, our new A&E department at Huddersfield opens imminently. We're about to start the same work over at Calderdale, um, which is really exciting. We're going to reconfigure that hospital with two new theatres, 10 new wards, a new N.E. department. It's it's going to be hugely exciting. But there's lots I want to do. I want to think about our workforce model, um, how we manage our money situation, how we get recruitment better to work. Think about the work that we're doing um, as an academy with a college. You know, what does what does that look like? How do we... And how do we tap into the energy of the next generation? And I'd really like to think that the next chief exec at Calderdale and Huddersfield Foundation Trust is here in Halifax or Huddersfield. Where are you? I yeah. want to spot that talent now. I don't think you answered this. Haven't I? Do, Have I dodged do, the question? No. What I was when I asked you why why you came back to Calderdale. Yeah. Did you answer that? I did. I, th I think I said. Oh, I feel I feel a depression now. I think I said it was because of the people, but it's equally because of the job. Because there yeah. was a lot to do. Um, well, I didn't know. The reason I've asked that is because yeah. for me, as an outsider, I don't know whether you've noticed I'm not yeah. local. It's your West Midlands accent. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is an incredible place. It is. It's an incredible place. So and, I love it here. Yeah. And it has so much to offer, and it feels like a really exciting time. Yeah, it does to be yeah. here in Calderdale yeah. and it feels like we're, we're part of something yeah big yeah so I, I've talked to the ministers this morning actually about get yourselves out of London and come and see what's happening in the north and come and see what's happening in Calderdale because it's great and it's not just about buildings it's about it, it's as you said it's the people but I, I really like the people up here I like the way they they live they work I like their ethos their honesty yeah it's it is exciting but you know, there's a lot of exciting things happening across Halifax that I think we're all tapping into. I think there's opportunities for business, there's opportunities for health, opportunities for education. Um, yeah, Culture, think, heritage. Th things are happening here. Landscape. Mm. It really is. Donkeys. A... Yeah, it's all happening here. <laughs> it's a fantastic place it to is. be, though, isn't it? Mm. And um, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. No, and I, I think, you know, I'm really hopeful that some of the great things that we're working on are going to be a reason for people to stay here um, or people to come here and work. I hope so. I hope the work we're doing together will future-proof opportunities for people and keep us at the top of our game, actually, and make us think outside the box, challenge ourselves and make keep us asking, well, are we doing the right thing for our people? And if we're not, well, what are we going to do about it then? Now, we've got a question okay. that we ask um, at the end Okay. Of each uh, of each podcast. So I want you to imagine that you get to send a text to yourself. Okay. As a teenager. Okay. Okay. What would you say about your future career? <laughs> and is there any advice that you'd share to yourself that perhaps you didn't receive at that age? So a text to myself. Okay, what would a text say? The text would start with don't worry, it will all work out. The second line would say, don't worry, you won't get found out. And the third text would say, enjoy it. Brilliant. Brendan, that has been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving up your time. Not at all. Thank you very much. Hey, really insightful. Thank you. Thank you.